Well, welcome. We're glad you're here. Uh, I'm Chad Wallace. I'm the Dean of the School of Science and Engineering here at AU, and we're really glad you're here tonight. Um, I'm very excited for tonight's show. It's really cool. Uh oh, that's me. Sorry. Yeah, I didn't take crap when you turn out. Go back home. So, tonight, we have uh, a couple of speakers tonight for Dr. Jay Weil. Um, and Dr. Scott Carr. <laughs> Dr. Weil is a PhD in nuclear chemistry from the University of Rochester. Uh, he's taught at Ball State University and IU. Um, but more recently, he's written a series of textbooks. He's written nine books um, that are mainly homeschool science books, the most popular homeschool science books out there. Um, <laughs> he's a wonderful teacher. In this semester, he's doing uh, he's teaching one of our chemistry classes for us. We're really excited about that. Uh, Dr. Carr is a professor of uh, chemistry here at AU, and uh, he has a PhD in analytical chemistry from Miami University in Ohio. And uh, tonight, they're going, I've asked them not to burn down the building with some of these explosions. We have a fire extinguisher just in case, but um, I think you're in for a real treat. This is going to be real fun. Uh, so without further ado, um, we'll introduce let them get started. Thanks. There we go. Yeah. Okay, well, welcome. Thanks for coming. Uh, I'm Jay Weil, Scott Carr. Uh, he and I work together on these demonstrations. He's been teaching for a lot longer than I have, so he's collected a lot of uh, demonstrations. Uh, I think a couple of years ago. Yeah, it's so, so he's collected a lot of demonstrations. Uh, some of them I've done over the years, and some, a couple of them we put together just for this. So, of course, those are the most exciting ones, because those have the highest probability of going wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so, when, uh, uh, when Dr. Wallace asked me to do this, I was honored to be a part of it. Uh, and I'm trying to think, what would I want to give to an audience uh, to, to kind of demonstrate my love for chemistry? And so what I thought I'd do is give you an experience that's kind of similar to what made me a chemist. Um, I started out uh, thinking about careers and I wanted to be a concert pianist. I still play the piano for fun, uh, but uh, my fingers are too stubby. Thanks, Mom and Dad. Um, and so I can't reach wide enough to do the, uh, the repertoire of concert pianists. But I love the art, so I actually started my life as a, a, a professional actor. I was in the Actors' Equity Union, did a lot of plays and so forth. Uh, found out pretty quickly that that lifestyle is not for me. <laughs> so I thought, okay, I should go to college and get a respectable job, but what should I study? Well, I thought, you know, as I've been doing these plays over the years, some of these plays had a lot of special effects in them. So I played Dracula, for example, and I had to light a cigarette by looking at it, and I had to do all these, had to disappear and things like that. And almost all these special effects were done by chemistry. So I thought, well, if chemistry can do cool stuff on stage, maybe if I learn more chemistry, I can learn more cool stuff. And so that's why I, became a, I started studying chemistry. And of course, as I started studying chemistry, learned even more cool stuff. Uh, and so I'm going to kind of communicate some of that to you today. Uh, but I thought I had at least a theme to go with this uh, evening. So my theme for this evening is one of my favorite topics, fire. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a pyromaniac. I think, honestly, all chemists are pyromaniacs. So, this is going to be about fire. We're going to learn some cool things about how fire works and what it's like and everything. So, we're going to start with these balloons. Um, these balloons are all floating in air, and that tells you something. That tells you that the gases inside are lighter than air. If I were to measure the weight of one of these balloons and all the gas inside, it weighs less than an equal volume of air. And since it weighs less than the air that it's displacing, it rises in air. That's why steel ships can float, even though steel blocks sink. The steel is, the ship is very heavy, but it's not as heavy as an equal volume of water. So it can float on the water. So all these balloons have gases in them that weigh less than air. But some of them weigh less than others. And to show you that, this is a hydrogen balloon, and this is a balloon that has methane in it. All right? Now, they're roughly the same size, but look what happens when I release them. A hydrogen balloon goes up really quickly. The methane balloon goes up, but goes up much more slowly. What does that tell you about the methane? It's, no, the methane's heavier. The hydrogen's going to be lighter because it floats faster. 
Alright, so it, it's displaced, it, it's, its weight is a lot lower, so it rises much faster than methane. Alright, so now we're going to get these two balloons out of here. Right? Uh, oh yeah, we're going to have to compare hydrogen to helium. Well, this is a helium balloon, and if I did compare hydrogen to helium, it's a little hard to tell, but the hydrogen balloon did rise just a little faster. But let's get the hydrogen out of there, and let's put on the safety goggles. So, now what I'm going to do is try to, try to burn this uh, helium to this balloon. Um, so, when I say burn, I mean serious. Alright? So, yeah, here we go. I'm going to burn this helium balloon, and it's not all that impressive. The balloon pops, but there was no fire. The reason there was no fire, of course, is that helium doesn't like to burn. Why doesn't helium like to burn? Helium is called a noble gas. We call it a noble gas not because it's particularly virtuous or anything, but because it doesn't like to react with anything. Back when people were thinking about names, we had the nobility, and they didn't like to interact with the masses. So the noble gases don't like to interact with the common chemicals. All right? So the noble gases don't like to react, and burning is a chemical reaction. Since helium is a noble gas, it doesn't do chemical reactions. Now, this is the hydrogen balloon, right? Yeah, it's okay. Alright, so, you probably know that hydrogen... You probably know that hydrogen will burn. So let's see what happens when I pop this balloon. And because it was much slower, the methane had time to expand before. 
And so the flame was expanded out. You also should have noticed, if you were paying colorful attention, that it wasn't as loud. Okay, once again, that's because the reaction is slower, and since it's slower, it's not going to be producing nearly as much energy. Is this water? No, we've got two methane. Okay, is this another methane? Okay, so we'll do another methane just because we have it. We always, we make spirits because I actually lost one hydrogen balloon. It's up there, so. <laughs> <laughs> It'll eventually come down. So. Okay, so here's another methane balloon. Again, bigger, uh, bigger flame, not as loud as an explosion, but not as loud as an explosion. Now, when you burn methane in your natural gas stove, you don't get an explosion like that. You get a nice, carefully controlled flame. And that's the, the only real difference between a nice, gentle flame that warms you and gives you a cheery feeling and an explosion that will blow your face off <laughs> is the amount of energy made in a certain amount of time. I can make the same amount of energy, but if I spread it over a long time, I have a nice gentle flame. I can take the same amount of energy, and if I make it over a very short time, I get a real explosion. So that's explosion is energy per time. That's power, and the more the, the faster you make the energy, the more power that's in the explosion. So I'm going back to hydrogen now, I'm going to burn hydrogen again, but this one's a little different. Because this balloon contains both hydrogen and oxygen. Now, because it contains both hydrogen and oxygen, it actually has less hydrogen than the balloon I burned before. All right, so it has less hydrogen than the balloon I burned before. Let's compare how this one works with less hydrogen. Ready? Uh, so I can't uh, uh, light 
these together. There's a spark plug here, and I'm going to uh, get the spark plug with a spark from a Tesla coil. Tesla coil makes a nice, strong spark. And when I do that, there you go. Okay. Yeah. That was cool, cute, and everything, but this was a fairly small cylinder, right? So I'm going to. Uh, so I'm going to do it with a bigger cylinder. This is what I'm this is 50 milliliters, this is 250, okay? So this is five times as much. So I get better launch and so forth. This one here is one liter. So it's four times as much as that. So oxygen, 
So that's why he went sort of up and down to show that the oxygen was going in and then getting pushed out. Alright? Okay.
And although it's exciting, it eventually wants to settle down. You know, we can get excited for a while, but we just can't maintain it. Eventually, we have to pump down, right? Chemicals are the same way. They can get excited, but eventually they have to release that extra energy. The sodium releases that extra energy in the form of lots of different forms of light, but in this case, the form of visible light uh, that's yellow. But not all the chemicals uh, produce yellow light when they burn. This is uh, copper chloride. Uh, and it's got a nice little green flame to it. This is the copper in there that's getting excited. And the way it's getting rid of its extra energy is to emit lots of different light. But the light that you see is green. You see a little blue in there, that's from the methanol that's burning. The green is from the excitement uh, of the copper. All right, so that's copper. This over here is strontium chloride. And when I burn strontium chloride, I get a nice blue, uh, yellow or red flame. So if I do this all together then, <laughs> I've got strontium, sodium, and uh, copper. Now, uh, sodium, its chemical abbreviation is Na. For uh, the Latin word, I'm sure I'm pronouncing it wrongly. It's na natrium or natrium or something like that. But it was called that because it seemed to be sort of the most natural thing. Virtually everything in nature has sodium in it. And that's why virtually everything you burn tends to burn yellow. When you burn wood, it tends to burn yellow because of, well, because of a lot of sodium in it. Um, you don't, but if you ever burn wrapping paper, for example, you'll often find wrapping paper burns with different colors. Because some of the chemicals used to make those different colors are copper or something like that. So it burns with a different, uh, different uh, flame. So is this potassium? So we got potassium. I've never been fond of potassium. You always have to do it, but to me, potassium looks just a lot like methanol. Uh, but this, uh, this flame is a little more purple than the, than the methanol flame. You see there's a little yellow in it because there's sodium contamination there. Sodium contaminates almost everything. But in the end, that's a nice little uh, uh, demonstration of how different chemicals, when they're excited, release different forms of energy. Now, all chemicals do this, but oftentimes the light they release isn't visible to us. But with the right kind of detector, you can detect it. So if you've ever wondered how some astrophysicist like John Mellis means here can stand up there and say the sun is made mostly of hydrogen and helium. We've never been to the sun. We've never sampled it. How can you know it's mostly hydrogen and helium? Because we look at the light that's coming from it. And the light that's coming from it is characteristic of a excited mixture of hydrogen and helium. So we can actually determine the composition of chemicals we have in our hands, but also things we can't even visit, as long as there's light coming from it. Because we can look at the different patterns of light that are emitted by the excited chemicals, and that can tell us something about the chemical that's uh, the chemicals that are in there. A little more, is it? Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, we're still on that idea of fire here. Remember, fire takes a fuel and oxygen. Uh, and the methanol uh, uh, big canisters that I used, the second time I tried to light that canister, it didn't work because there wasn't enough oxygen in there. So, with too little oxygen, it's funny. Uh, with too little oxygen, you end up uh, uh, having not enough flame. If I want to increase the amount of flame, you add more oxygen. All right? So there are a lot of different ways you can do that. I'm going to do it. Uh, so that's not the long time. So go ahead and uh, do the lights again.
because it just naturally decomposes into water and oxygen. So you think if I mix hydrogen peroxide and ethanol, burn the ethanol, that extra oxygen that's coming from the hydrogen peroxide should speed up the burning process a lot. But it turns out it doesn't because hydrogen peroxide decomposes very slowly. So it does turn into water and oxygen, but over a very, very long, long time period. Not enough to make a noticeable difference in burning. So when I like this, I just get that standard blue flame. However, hydrogen peroxide does like to react with other things to make oxygen. So if I react with a little potassium, <laughs>
I got a feeling it's just going to go make a fireball, and then um, that'll be it. But we'll see. Or not to use catch paper on fire. That's a really nice thing. Well, there it goes. Maybe catch paper on fire. Thanks, Jim. Thanks for letting me do the demo. <laughs> Okay, figure it out. 
So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take this uh, filament and I'm going to stick it in the liquid nitrogen. All right, go ahead and turn it on. All right, now the tungsten's getting hot. Can you hear the boiling? Right? So that tungsten's getting hot and it's boiling the liquid nitrogen. But notice, because there's no oxygen in there, there's no smoke, the tungsten's not burning. It's just getting hot. So as far as this tungsten is concerned, it's kind of like it's still inside the light bulb because there's no oxygen to react with. So as a result, it's going to stay lit as long as I want it to stay lit. The, the, the liquid nitrogen is actually cooling it as well, and that helps maintain the integrity of the tungsten. I only thought this would work. This is one of the demos I put together. I only thought this would work. But it turns out it really does work well. <laughs> I'd say, well, that's hot. And my dad would always say, I don't know why we cooked it in the refrigerator. <laughs> so 
So I'm going to tell you that's cool. I don't know why we cooked it in boiling lava. It 
No, it's a solid. So this dry ice is a solid. The bubbles you're seeing are carbon dioxide coming off the solid because the solid is now heating up. In this flask, I have uh, a solution that's basic. It's alkaline. And the indicator tells me it's alkaline because it's blue. As time goes on, that color is going to change. But while that's going on, we're going to do another one. We're running short on time here. As the CO2 dissolves in the water, it gets more and more acidic. Alkaline is basic. So we go from a purple, which is really basic, to a blue, which is still basic, to a green, which is neutral. And then eventually it'll get to yellow, or orange and yellow, and then if it was really acidic, it would turn red. Carbon dioxide does all the water isn't that acidic, it's just a little bit acidic, and so it'll turn yellow. And it'll, it'll hang out there, uh, it's kind of yellow-green now, so it's on its way to making a uh, yellow solution. And so this is one of the reasons why um, people are worried about CO2 being, uh, the level being increased in the atmosphere because it'll dissolve uh, it'll make the, salute, the, the ocean solutions more acidic and it'll begin to dissolve uh, coral and stuff. So that's one of the thoughts that they have. So now, this, uh, uh, what we've got here is a pipe, and I put some soap on the end of the pipe, and I'm going to put this carbon dioxide that's coming up out of this bottle up here. And.
All right? Um, now, eventually it goes, goes away. Uh, and if you look at what we've got remaining, we've got a white solid. Yeah, turn the light on. That. We've got a white solid, and that's magnesium oxide. So the carbon dioxide is reacted with magnesium to make magnesium oxide. What's left over? Carbon, right? See those little white flecks? If I actually open this up, see how black it is on the inside? That's the carbon from the carbon dioxide. So the carbon dioxide reacted with the magnesium, magne magnesium oxide, and the elemental carbon was left over, and that's the black stuff. If I burn magnesium in air, I just get magnesium oxide, I just get a white powder. I burn it in carbon dioxide, and I get the white powder plus a bunch of black stuff. Okay.